Hi, I'm Ashley with Campbell. Thanks for investing your time to help your community be a great place to live. Before you watch the video, make sure to click the subscribe button so that we can help you make educated decisions as a board member. Thank you. <laughs> Kathy Slight with Vote HOA Now. We are the industry experts in online voting for associations. That is all that we serve. Today, this presentation is designed uh, just to give you some ideas and some things to consider. You know, uh, online voting has been legal in Florida since 2015, so it's not new. Uh, we have a lot of clients in Florida, and they are successful at reaching quorum and having uh, you know, passing amendments, reaching quorum, and these membership votes. They are seeing increased participation, and so I'm hoping that the information I share with you today will just give you a little bit of more of a foundation when you're thinking about it or when you're considering online voting. So let's get started. All right, so I'm going to go over the state statutes just so that you know what section you should be looking at. Uh, it's fun when we just, you know, focus on one part of the state statutes that makes it easy for us to help you find the electronic voting portion. Understanding and choosing a service level, you know, the this is true with every vendor that you're talking to or every, uh, you know, job that you have on your property, you're going to look and understand that service level who should be involved, setting the parameters of your vote, the vote itself, getting started, what you should expect, things that you should consider, uh, the successful transition from paper ballots to electronic ballots, and some of the benefits of electronic voting. Those of you who have considered or looked into it probably already know some of the benefits, but I'll go over some additional ones. And then I have a fun slide at the end that I like to do called myth busting. And it's all of the reasons that you might not consider using an electronic voting. And hopefully we can bust some of those myths and you'll consider it for your next membership vote or election. Now, Florida, the e-voting codes, of course, I'm not going to read all these word for word. They'll be in the presentation when you receive this information from Campbell. But 718 is the condominium statute, and it does have the admin code and rule. Uh, 719 is the cooperative statute, and 720 is the HOA statute. So they are different. Uh, they all have a lot of things in common. So I would say that the condominium uh, statute is the one that stands out that may have just a few different uh, items that you have to follow if you're in a condominium. It's always the condominiums, we say. They always have a higher level of authority they have to follow. Now, the 718, of course, is the condo statute. And like I said, I'm not going to read through these, but I'm sure that you're trying to read this right now. But some of the basic things that it does call out for is we must be able to authenticate the identity, protect the secrecy and integrity of each ballot, and a method to confirm delivery. So I'm sure that in your mind, you're already thinking of all of these things, and I'm going to go over each one of them. Now, here is uh, the Florida state statute continued. Uh, of course, they're able to identicate, authenticate the owner's identity. And really, all of this is just information that you are going to provide to us or to the online voting partner in order to load the owner data. So all of this information is loaded, and that is how we authenticate the owner's identity. Uh, to ensure the vote is not altered in transit, this is really important that the selections that the owner makes are the selections that uh, are received on their receipt. So once you submit your electronic ballot, you will receive a receipt of exactly how you voted. And if you're looking at other e-voting systems, make sure that this is a step that they offer, that the owners are going to get a receipt of exactly how they voted. Uh, and then, of course, uh, able to support client with any recount inspection or inspection of re or review. 
And this just means if your vote is challenged or your owners are asking questions, you want to be able to go back to your e-voting provider and ask them to assist you with these important things. And typically they will have a process outside of the electronic voting that will help you with some of these challenges or requests. Now, um, e-votes count towards quorum. This is the best thing about electronic ballots is that number one, uh, they can't make too many choices on an electronic ballot. They can make fewer. Uh, and every electronic ballot, of course, is counted towards quorum for the meeting. So uh, there's no really, uh, we're going to get to the slide. I'm probably getting a little ahead of myself. Uh, no running around at the last minute asking people to complete their ballot or come to the meeting to reach quorum. Uh, electronic voting is proven over and over. And in fact, we're even 95% successful at reaching quorum for you before your meeting. So every electronic ballot, of course, counts towards quorum. Now, in order to be uh, successful and set the guidelines for your community, the best thing, of course, is to create a resolution. Now, what we've done is we've looked at the state statutes, we understand the requirements there, and then we've gone to our documents to make sure that we don't have anything in there that's prohibiting us from using electronic voting. And we'd be looking for a statement that says you cannot use any form of electronic means or it doesn't mention if it doesn't mention anything, we still can grasp onto that section of the documents and uh, create a resolution and to, to further clarify what the online voting processes. So uh, create a resolution, must provide that unit owner receive the notice of the opportunity to vote through the online voting system, must establish reasonable procedures and deadlines for unit owners to consent in writing to online voting. Now, this is one of the differences between Florida and some other states is that they do have that requirement asking the owners if they would like to use online voting. And really, you know, in every electronic vote, uh, they should be asked and given the opportunity to say yes or to say no. Uh, that should be just a general practice. So just remember that in your head, they always will have the ability to consent or to say no that they prefer to vote by a different method. And then, of course, you know how you're going to receive the notice. Uh, you know, in most cases, it is 14 days before the meeting. So all of this information should go into your resolution. Uh, if you need some help at the end, I'm going to put up our uh, email address and we do have some sample documents that will help and guide you on our website. So lots of fun things. What does electronic voting mean for everyone? We love saying this here at Vote HOA Now, no more proxies. This really does put the ownership back in the owner's hands. They are making their selections from the comfort of their home. They can vote from a computer, from their tablet, or from their phone and submit their ballot instantly. No more. They, you don't even have to walk to the mailbox to put that stamp on your envelope or send it back. Or maybe you've got a self-addressed stamped envelope already and you're sending it back. You don't even have to do that. Don't have to collect proxies. Remember, every electronic ballot does count towards quorum. Now let's talk a little bit more about creating your e-voting resolution because you know what we feel like this is one of the most professional steps. Uh, be as concise as you can uh, in your resolution following both the state statutes and your governing documents. So you are going to have to find your reference section in your documents to do this. Uh, additional items to consider when you're creating your resolution. Send paper proxies only to those that opt out. Now, this uh, you'll have a list of email addresses, and those owners will, of course, receive their electronic ballot. And then for those that you don't have an email address for, or maybe you know they don't have access to a device, uh, you would want to continue to send them a paper ballot. Uh, a paper packet, sorry. Um, and, you know, that will help you, of course, cut down on the amount of paper that you're mailing out. Uh, and we always say, make it a choice in your uh, 
save the date that you're sending like, hey, we're adding electronic voting this year. We hope you'll all use it. Or he And here is a link to our voting site. If we don't have your email address, you can still vote electronically or please contact the office and let us know if you don't have access to a device and you still would like to receive a paper packet. So those are some things you can talk about early. You can put into newsletters. You can put on your uh, statements. We're just getting ready to bill for the first of the year. What a great idea to ask owners to provide that primary voting email address. And if you have time, you may want them just to send you an email like, yes, this is my primary voting email address and I do want to vote electronically. It's never too late to start collecting those emails from those who want to vote electronically. Now, after your initial voting experience, this is really important. You know, resolutions are painful enough as it is, and it takes a lot to create one, but it really does set the foundation for a successful electronic vote or membership vote or anything that you're voting on in your community. Make sure that after you've had your first online voting experience, that you're going back and you're rereading your resolution and you're making sure that you included all of the steps. So kind of like a summary of what went right and what went wrong. Let's go back, look at our resolution. Let's make any updates that we need to to our processes in the resolution and make sure that we're sending it back out to our owners so they'll know exactly what to expect once another membership vote or an election comes up. So just, you know, be aware, go back and look at your information, make sure you're making the most of the updates. Don't let an old still resolution hang out uh, out there with some uh, steps in there that you don't want to repeat or you haven't included any new steps. So just remember that. Go back and look at your resolution again. Now, another thing, of course, that we talk about all the time is understanding and choosing a service level. This is kind of like, you know, choosing your doctor, choosing your attorney. Uh, you want to make sure you understand the full package. So I'm going to go through each one of them. Now, full service providers. This is a online voting provider that is going to do everything for you. They are going to set the parameters of your vote. They are going to build your ballots. They're going to assist you with all of those questions. Uh, they generally run and manage your vote and provide the full final report to you, answering questions all along. But what we say is, you know, let uh, managers have enough work as it is being a manager. Let the online voting companies take care of running that election or membership vote for you. So it will free up the manager to work on the projects that you want them to work on in your community. It really does let the professionals do what they do best. And a third party separation protects the board members, committee members, and any um, managers from being involved in that setup process, seeing information that they're that they should not be looking at before the end of the vote, um, which leads us, of course, to the self-service portals or management software. And these are becoming really popular. You know, everyone wants to have an add-on. It's nice to save money to set up your vote. Uh, I always think, of course, you know. You may have someone on your board that's really, really good at IT that year, and they whiz through it. They set up the ballots. You know, they don't have any problem. But what happens if they move or they have to resign? You're starting over from scratch. So think about those things when you're looking at a service provider. The self-service portal and the management software is does have a little higher risk because uh, it's not really, it's a manager being an election expert, and they may not follow the same process each time. They may have someone else who's assisting. And if your vote was ever challenged or your owners had questions, it would be the manager and the board that they'd be looking to for all these questions, where I think that you would prefer that it be the third party professional they'd be asking these the questions to the third party professional and they'd be answering them and standing behind the process that they follow in the office. So those are really the two differences be, between the full service provider and the self-service portal or management software. So if you're thinking about what service level, you should really go back and look at the slide and make sure 
um, you know, that you're, that you understand the risk level of each. All right, I did say that I would stop here and uh, shortly and answer any questions that are coming in. I'm gonna go to one more slide and then I'll stop and take any questions. Now we say here, all vendors are not the same. You know it, you've had these experiences. Uh, work with an e-voting partner that at least understands the community association industry. We all know we're a unique bunch of people. We're in this little you know, uh, niche. It's becoming more and more recognized as a professional industry and you are a professional community manager. Uh, they're probably even starting to talk about it in college and that type of thing. Uh, so we have some community managers out there that have not come into the industry yet, but it is becoming more and more recognized uh, that your vendor has HOA condo management experience leaders. This would mean to me that they've gone to a meeting, they understand the election process, they know how to read a set of documents and help you understand what parameters you should be setting. It's nice if they're based in the US, that means that they understand that each state does have a set of state statutes, exactly what we looked at earlier for Florida, those three sections that outline and, and uh, guide us to help us uh, incorporate online voting into our communities. They do provide that third party separation, that full service setup and management. And, you know, full service setup and management can move from manager to manager to manager. Uh, you know, we'd like to say that there aren't any manager changes in our industry, but there are. And they can also move from management company to management company. Your owners will never know what's going on in the background. It is the same seamless full service professional set up and management. Now, just think about this. If you were uh, using one of the self-service models or you were using a management uh, portal, that, that all of that information would not move from management company to management company. So just some things to consider when you're looking at what service level. Let the managers do what they do best, be managers. It's a hard enough job anyway. I know, I remember I was a manager for years uh, and let someone else take care of all the election and voting needs. And you know, in Florida, board members, committee members, and even managers are becoming more and more responsible for everything that's happening. They have so much to monitor. Uh, why have them be an election expert as well? So that's just my opinion on that. Of course, I'm sure you feel the same way. So I think I can read some of the um, statements. So I'll go through them here really quickly because there's no time. Like now we have a whole hour together. We might make, might as well make the most of it. Uh, Paul says, is online voting an all-in situation or can some continue to vote via other means? Great question. You will never have all the email addresses, everyone. So you still are going to be faced with, number one, you still have to send your official notice by US mail. That is still a requirement. Hopefully it's just gonna be a one page notice that has the voting options on there. And you can cut down on those huge election packages that are going out but you're still going to have pay people and owners that are going to ask for a paper ballot, or maybe you're having an in-person meeting, you're accepting paper ballots at that time. So that's always the case. And what would happen is the electronic voting portion of it would be closed, and then you would add any paper tallies to the electronic voting tallies to announce the results that night at the meeting. So in most cases, we're going to see that vote run early, like an absentee ballot getting to the meeting, it would be closed and then you would deal with any paper ballots at the meeting. So thank you for asking that question, Paul. That was a great one. Let's go down to Alex. Must you have both electronic and manual voting systems if residents choose the manual? So I think we just talked about that. Yes, you're going to offer electronic voting as one of the options. 
then they can certainly ask for a paper ballot if they would prefer to complete that paper ballot and return it to you by the deadline. That really is the key. I'm sure everyone can raise their hand out there and say that, um, you know, they've received a bunch of uh, paper ballots after the day of the meeting that would have helped them achieve quorum. And so uh, make sure that you're giving them plenty of time to return that paper ballot by the due date. But yes, in all cases, paper and electronic ballots are still just an option that you're offering in your community. All right, so Daniel, what if you don't have email addresses for a decent size of your members in the HOA? Uh, is a hybrid the way to go? And, uh, you know, yes, a hybrid is the way to go. You're going to have to offer them the choices. They're going to select whichever one works for them. It's amazing how easy online voting is. They just receive an invitation to vote by email. They follow all the steps or they would have to go through the process of filling out that paper ballot and returning it by the due date, of course. So all of those questions kind of are similar, uh, but hybrid it, hybrid is becoming a really familiar word in our industry because almost everything we do, we're having a hybrid meeting, we're having a hybrid vote, you know, where uh, some is in person, some is virtual. And so we're, we're turning into hybrid experts here. Uh, let's see. Hi, thanks for the info. Could this be used for board voting as well? And I think I understand what you mean that can it be used at a board meeting when the board members are voting yes or no? Uh, it could be. It's expensive uh, unless you're setting up your own board meeting vote. And then, of course, you would have to have a process. So in most cases, no, it's not used for those board meeting votes. It is only used for uh, document required votes, such as elections, amendments, and any other kind of membership votes. All right. Gosh, thank you so much for all the questions. I'm going to take a couple more. Um, I'm going to go to the bottom and grab a couple from there because I feel like I skipped over some. Uh, the online pro voting process was exceptionally easy. Any strategies on how to increase percentage of online voting users? Yes. Make sure that you're always talking about online voting and everything that you send. Like I said, uh, even putting it on your statements, you know, we're getting ready to send our end of year statements. And it's a great way to say that you're going to be incorporating it. Uh, the resolution is another great way, you know, passing a resolution as just a board authority. If you've looked at your documents, you've looked at your state statutes, you're able to pass a resolution without uh, going, you know, to amend your documents, then sending out that information with a cover letter, you know, is a great way to uh, announce online voting and continue to talk about it in newsletters and any other way that you can communicate with your um, with your community, which is great. So thanks for that question, Paul. I hope that helps. Uh, just continue to encourage people to provide their email addresses. And, you know, once they're using the system and they voted and they have uh, they are starting to trust it, they feel comfortable with it, they've received a receipt of exactly how they voted, we are showing a more professional side in online voting and in voting in general to our owners, and they are going to begin to have a comfort level with it. They're going to talk to other uh, owners or neighbors about it. And so it becomes a way uh, that you do business. Just like every Thursday, they expect the landscaper to show up and mow the lawn. All right. Uh, how does it work if an owner wants to change their ballot? Uh, in most cases, all electronic ballots are final. If you wanted to allow a process for owners to change their ballot, that would be manually at the meeting. You would ask them for their receipt. You would determine how they voted, make any necessary adjustments, adjust the electronic voting tally and add it to your paper tally. It can become very cumbersome. So uh, it's nice to put in your resolution that if you submit electronically, all electronic ballots are final. You know, things come up and emergencies do happen and people want to change their vote. And we'll deal with with each one of those as they come in. But in most cases, if you are having an in-person meeting, we would say, if you would like to vote in person, please do not submit your ballot electronically. So there's some things that we can say that can help you or things that you can say that will help you with that. It's 
great for board elections, Holly. Thank you. And membership votes. Uh, you know, we do paint schematics, designs, uh, membership votes, amendments, items, issues, surveys, you know, everything. All right. Well, I'm going to move forward. I did not get to all of the questions and we'll stop and take another little break here shortly and make sure that we're answering all those questions for you. So let's talk a little bit more about, all right, we've determined our service level, we're having full service setup and management, or we're going to manage this vote ourselves. This is the process we're going to follow, you know, setting the parameters of the vote and who is going to be involved is probably one of the most important things that you're going to do. So in all cases, there should be a single point of contact. Uh, should it be the manager or board or committee members? Um, in most cases, it is the manager. They are the individual that has access to all of the information that the online voting provider or the uh, to set up the ballot, the manager typically would have all of that information. So I would say that in 98% of the cases, we are working with the manager. Uh, of course, there are some situations where we have an on-site manager or they don't have a management company and we're working with the board member. And um, so, you know, on the full service end, we'll make sure that we're protecting you from having any information that you should not be looking at, you know, before the vote closes. So manager or admin assistant staff is recommended if you have access to them. Uh, they are a neutral party with no ownership in the association. They're available to answer owner questions. In fact, they're receiving owner phone calls all day long and answering questions and providing that written documentation to the owners about what to expect during an online vote. Uh, they have the ability to provide the vote ballot info and owner list. So like I said, they'll have access to the system to export that Excel spreadsheet out. And they are the ones who typically are, re are collecting those nom those nomination forms or, you know, photos, videos. I haven't even talked about how fun online ballots are, but they really are becoming more and more interactive and really fun for owners to vote. Uh, they're going to read everything. Thing, look at it, whoever that single point of contact is, is going to be responsible for providing those approvals on the information that was put into the system uh, and, you know, the ballots, everything, and they will be the ones who re will receive that final report and take it to the meeting. So it doesn't really matter what service level you're using, whether it's full service or you're using a portal or you're using uh, the management software, make sure that you have one person that is really dialed into that vote that is uh, providing all those services on this list when you're setting those parameters. And it could be, you know, the manager and the admin are working together. Now, that's not all. There are more uh, parameters, of course. Uh, usage, how to make the most of your online vote. You know, we get all in a zone where we're just thinking about elections or maybe we've got this big amendment coming up and we're, you know, unfortunately, amendments in the past have taken, you know, sometimes years uh, to pass. It takes people walking through the neighborhood, knocking on doors, and it really is a huge effort for the board of directors to take on uh, electronic voting. You know, the whole reason that electronic voting is so successful, of course, is because we're able to send those email invitations to vote and reminders every two to three days, more than you ever could by sending out a piece of paper or going around knocking on doors. So the opportunity and the ability to increase the participation is there. It's all in the way, you know, that, uh, that you're sending out those email invitations and reminders. Uh, of course, once someone submits their ballot and receives their receipt, they should not receive another email. So, all right, let me get back on track here. Uh, usage, if you are planning to have an election, if you're planning to have an amendment vote or you have a big membership vote coming up, uh, try and bundle them all together. Uh, we're gonna get their opt-in right away uh, when they start voting, they're gonna say yes or no. Uh, and then we're going to have them vote in the election and on the amendment. It really is the best way to get their attention all at once. Uh, you know, I we always say that, um, of course, having a multiple ballots does save money. It can be less expensive to add on an additional ballot at the time of an election, or maybe you're running an amendment 
amendment and you add on your election. Of course, we would always want to separate those. I want you to remember if you're doing this on your own, uh, if the quorum requirement is different for an amendment, an election, or a membership vote, depending on what it is, uh, you do want to separate it onto a separate ballot. And the reason is that you will want a full final report for each one of those ballots uh, so that you can say, yes, we achieved 20% quorum for the election. We were able to pass our amendments with 67%. You want to have the ability to print those final results for each ballot. So you'll have them with that packet. Maybe you have to go in and record your documents and they might ask you for that ballot backup or what the total percentage of the votes were. So uh, very important to separate those if they have a different quorum. So just remember that uh, and bundle them together if you can, because you can make the most of your time with that owner and they'll be able to vote on all of the issues. Now, uh, the types of votes that we normally see are, of course, uh, annual meetings, elections. Uh, don't forget to include your meeting minutes, your IRS 7604, that IRS revenue ruling that some of your uh, tax providers might ask you to have passed at an annual meeting. So all of those things can go on the electronic ballot plan to add them on. When you get to the meeting, everything will already be approved. And you're just dealing with a few little paper ballots or owners that like to attend the meetings and come visit and submit their ballot. Uh, amendments, CCNRs, bylaw votes. Now, these are the separate ballots that I'm talking about. And any other membership votes that are required, you know, online voting can cover all of these things. Once you get your good list of those email addresses of the owners that are enjoying to vote electronically, don't forget to ask them if they'd like to receive their notices electronically. Uh, that is just a yes or no question that can go on any one of those ballots and it sets you up for success in the future, of course, of having those email addresses when you're sending out notices and whatnot. And, you know, a lot of you have, you know, other software that is collecting those uh, that information from owners. So, you know, you may have already started on those consents to receive notices or electronic voting. All right, I'm not going to get stuck on this slide. I'm going to go on because uh, the vote itself, getting started. Now, these are just some things to consider. Uh, the vote start and end. We like to see electronic votes for elections at least run 14 days before we get to the annual meeting. And typically those uh, electronic ballots and the paper ballots are going in the mail with the you know, official meeting notice on the same day. So we're trying to you know, coordinate everything together. Everything should start at the same time. Uh, call for candidates. This is what is really going to set you apart. Uh, you know, be sure to run that call for candidates for a couple of weeks. Make sure owners have a form or instructions on how to submit information about why they would be a good representative in their community. By that due date, make sure that they're getting any uh, information and let those candidates know that you will not be considered on the paper ballot or the electronic ballot if you do not get your candidate form in by the due date. And then set your due date, allowing yourself a, you know, at least a four or five day span in there to build the ballot, set all the parameters and everything before you actually drop that official notice in the mail or start that electronic vote. So, uh, you know, start early. Uh, sometimes, you know, we say 60, 90 days of planning, you know, is, uh, you know, may be required in some situations, especially if you have a larger community and you want to allow those additional timelines for owners to submit their candidacy. Now, this seems silly. Uh, of course, you know, what is the quorum? Make sure you understand your election quorum, your amendment quorum, or any membership vote quorum. Say quorum three times fast. That was tough. Uh, how many positions? What are the terms? Uh, you know, sometimes we've gotten, we have a board that is seated that doesn't have any uh, prior information. Uh, start over. 
You know, one, two, three, we've got three seats, one year, two year, three year. It's okay to do the right thing today uh, and start, uh, you know, using electronic voting. Of course, look back at your meeting minutes, make sure they were passed from last year. We are running a lot of votes right now with those meeting minutes and those IRS ruling forms that haven't been passed for the last two or three years. So just be sure to include everything how many positions is it an election? Do we have write-ins? Uh, you know, minimum, the condo code does say minimum 14 days voting. Candidates listed in alphabetical order by last name cannot say incumbent. They can talk about how they serve the community in their resume or in their 200 word, you know, written word about why they would be a good representative, but the ballot itself cannot say incumbent. Make sure that you're looking at these things if you are setting up your own vote. Uh, no write-ins in some cases. Once the call for candidates period is over, no one else can nominate themselves. And we always get the question, of course, you know, what happens when I get to the meeting if someone nominates themselves? Uh, and, you know, I always said we never turned away anyone. We would ask them to fill out the paperwork just like all the other candidates did. Uh, we would vet them, make sure they're current on their assessments or whatever the requirements are. And if we had a position, uh, position open on the board, we would ask the board to appoint them at the next meeting. So those are just some ways. Or maybe you need a candidate that night and you've got uh, a group of your members there and you might just appoint them on to the board that evening. So there's a couple different ways you can look at those uh, nominations from the floor. And then of course, secret ballots, you know, Florida does require that it is a secret ballot. And that means that not even us or anyone can see how anyone voted. So make sure if you're setting it up yourself that you don't have access to the, this information. Now, this is really a very overlooked thing, uh, the owner date of record. Uh, a lot of us, you know, oldies but goodies, we've had to deal with this a few times, but sometimes in your uh, Nonprofit Corporation Act or in your documents or other places in the state statute, there could be an owner date of record. And simply what this means is just that uh, you must be an owner of this date, which is typically the date that we are sending out the notices or ballots in order to vote in this election or on, you know, in this membership vote or maybe even on this amendment vote. It, I can't imagine it would be for amendments, but there is an owner data record and it does help and guide you. This can save you a lot of pain during the open voting period because you don't have to worry about uh, changes in ownership or anything during that time those new owners will be eligible to vote in the next vote. So you're not changing emails, you're not changing lot addresses, you're not trying to monitor and manage all of that together. So if you've got an owner data record, use it. It could be your best friend moving forward. Now, I feel like my next slide is going to some benefits of a successful vote. So I think I'm going to stop here and see if we can answer some more questions because we do have a little bit of time. Okay, I'm just going to start at the top then. Uh, Ron says, if the electronic voting platform has a system outage for a portion of the voting period, does, does this invalidate the election? Uh, yeah, well, I think that if an owner could not submit their electronic vote, uh, then they would come back and try again. They would receive another invitation to vote. So electronically, um, you know, we have never had an outage or had to stop a vote uh, for any reason for that. Um, but it would not necessarily invalidate the vote. It just may delay the voting for that owner. In most cases, they're going to receive another reminder or an invitation to vote. So they could just move forward and continue. You know, that if it does happen, the voting provider might send out an email that says, gosh, you know, we did have an outage. And if you tried to submit your ballot, everything is up and running now. Please feel confident that all the votes that were received already are have been tallied. But if you were unable to submit your ballot, please try again. So we're going to ask them to try again. That was a great question, Ron. Thank you. Um, let's see. Cost. I'll get to the cost at the end. Um, 
I am unclear as to which prevails, online, proxy, mail if they send it all in. Well, these are things you're going to determine in your resolution. Uh, in most cases, all electronic ballots are final, but if you want to allow a manual process for owners to change their votes or submit a paper ballot, if they're unsure who to vote on electronically, they should come to the meeting and fill out a paper ballot. Um, so um, hopefully that helped answer your question. Uh, confidentiality with with whom or what they vote for. Yes, uh, most votes in Florida are secret. So the only person that knows how they voted is the owner. And that information, of course, is on their receipt of exactly how they voted. So that was a great question. I'm getting lots of questions here. Sorry, I'm trying to keep track of them all. Let's go to Barbara's. Uh, Barbara says, don't we still have to send out paper resumes of candidates? only to those that you don't have an email address for. In most cases, an online voting system or an electronic ballot can hold what we call the voters pamphlet and all of the information about the candidates, photos, one to five minute videos, uh, their candidate forms, all of that information can go into that pamphlet or on the electronic ballot, similar to how you would do with a paper ballot but more efficient because we're loading those uh, PDF voter pamphlets on the ballot. So send a full package to anyone you don't have an email address for. We hope they'll convert and you know go on and vote electronically, but they then would be responsible for sending back in their paper ballot. Uh, let's see, let's grab a couple more. Joe Kennedy, I'll get to the cost at the end. Uh, and give you an idea of what it costs. If an owner consents to vote online and then comes to the office to get a paper ballot, how is that managed? Uh, in most cases, we're gonna give you a list of all of the owners who have not voted electronically so that if you are still accepting or receiving those paper ballots, you can look at that list. Those would be the ballots that you would receive, check off, and then set aside to be opened in whatever secrecy process you're going to open those out at the meeting. That was a great question. Uh, can the board create and approve a resolution without getting a vote of the owners? Well, resolutions are designed just for that, uh, that board members are able to pass a resolution. They must notify the owners that they passed a resolution. But in, in some cases, if it is a good option, it really does save the community a lot of money rather than going to an amendment. But, you know, most cases, amendments turn into this situation where if you're going to do an amendment, you might as well look at your documents and update everything. Uh, so, you know, if you don't have the ability to use any electronic means in your documents, then you're probably looking at a document amendment. But, you know, I'm not an attorney. I only play one at work and to give advice based on my, um, you know, history and, and my work experience. Uh, but, you know, sometimes we have to go to the attorney to ask for their opinion. And you should. And you even should, if you're going to pass a resolution, make sure that it has all that information of course, that is required for a resolution. All right, uh, last one, Linda. Last election for board votes of trust without a voting certificate on file were disqualified. How do we prevent that from happening? That is a great question. Uh, yes, anyone who you don't have a voting certificate for, and this is typically happens when you've got multiple owners on a lot, then you're going to send them a paper ballot. They can still determine between them who the vote, the primary voter is. They may have to fill out that certificate, get it back to you, and then their electronic vote could be uh, counted. Of course, you know, all of these things are, are information, newsletter articles, uh, things that we should send to our owners to make sure we're getting those certificates or getting their opt-in or anything that we need to make sure that their electronic vote, of course, is going to count. So in all online voting systems, there has to be one primary voting individual that represents that unit of multiple owners. And that is when you would need that certificate when there are multiple owners. 
and who they're identifying who is going to represent their lottery unit. So those are all things that you can do anytime throughout the whole entire year and just continue to add to that list. And we all know how, you know, the mail, maybe you can, there are other ways that you can encourage people to come into the clubhouse and fill out their certificate or other information. I know how difficult that can be, but continue, continue trying to get those. All right, I know I haven't gotten to all the questions. I really appreciate everyone. I'm gonna try and get to them at the end, but I'm gonna finish my last slides here. Uh, we're gonna talk about some of the benefits of a successful vote. So uh, of course the biggest benefit is it's easy for owners to vote. They can do it from anywhere. They can be, you know, in a in a bar, in a car, in a plane, on a cruise ship. Uh, you know, we've had owners vote from everywhere. They can vote from their personal computer, their tablet, or their device. Makes it easy. Any device they can receive email on and they have access to the internet, they can vote electronically, uh, a receipt of exactly how they voted. This is the most professional thing we've done with voting in this industry is providing our owners with a receipt, what a comfort level they will have knowing their vote counted, their vote was received, and it was tallied by the due date. You know, we've never been able to offer this with paper ballots, and that leads us to no miscounted ballots. Electronic ballots will not allow them to make too many selections. Elections. There is a registration page or a signature page or whatever that provider is providing for them to sign those, uh, you know, ballots. You all know you've gotten these ballots that have everything marked, no signature, or you know they've been filled out incorrectly, and we've had to set them aside to use them for quorum only. Electronic ballots are not that way. We will ask them to complete their ballot correctly. <coughs> authenticated results instantly. And this just means that every vote is tallied instantly once it's received and that electronic voting receipt has been sent. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm gonna stop and take a drink of water. So it does uh, go to a much higher participation rate. <clears throat> Excuse me again. Uh, of course, you have an important presentation and you cough in the middle of it. So much higher participation rate. We're giving owners multiple opportunities to participate in any vote electronically, by paper, or coming to the meeting. Achieve quorum more reliably. <clears throat> And like I said, uh, we're over 95% successful at reaching quorum before the meeting. And this is the most important thing. Uh, duly elected board members with a normal rotation of terms. Now, uh, any if you have an insurance claim or a lawsuit or something that is brought to the community, the first thing they're going to ask you for anymore is, have you, have you, do you have a duly elected board of directors? Let us see your last set of meeting minutes. So don't be, uh, you know, be prepared for this. Make sure that you're passing your meeting minutes at your annual meeting and that you are reaching quorum and you're having a duly elected board each and every year that has the ability to represent the community in a lawsuit or anything, an insurance claim. These are going to be some of the most important things that you've done. Um, so make sure that you are having a duly elected board. I can't tell you enough how many times we've had to run an emergency vote for a board of directors or something because of one of these situations. And they had gone for like five or 10 years without reaching quorum and they really did not have a duly elected board and they needed those representatives to be elected because, you know, the DNO insurance needs to kick in and other policies that cover the association and our volunteers, you know, that are volunteering their time. We want them to, of course, be covered uh, when they're sitting on the board of directors. So just a few more things, of course, that you could should consider uh, when you're talking about a successful vote. And then, you know, there can't just be one page of benefits. There has to be two. 
The best one. Managers, board members, committee members, no more door-to-door -door work or rolling over the board for another year. It's okay if they're reelected and they're the same board members. Run your vote anyway. Make sure they're duly elected. And some of your documents might say that, you know, the president, the person with the highest votes uh, is the president. The person with the middle is the uh, secretary or the treasurer. And so it might actually call out how they're seated on the board too. Uh, so just make sure that you're meeting quorum. And you know, sometimes we don't have any candidates and we're running a quorum only vote so that we're sure they can have that annual meeting and they can nominate from the floor, but they're meeting quorum. So they are having that duly elected meeting and they are electing their board there at the meeting. Hopefully they'll get some people that stand up or their board is rolled over. So uh, once adopted, e-voting works for any required membership vote or election. Uh, so it can continue on. You can continue using it. Uh, that opt-in is good until they opt out. Uh, so, you know, those are the kind of lists that you're going to keep at the office. Of course, you know, uh, at the end of a vote, you'll know how who has opted into electronic voting because there are several ways they can do that. They can contact you and fill out their form. They can follow the instructions on their ballot to opt in, or they can send in their paper ballot. So all of those, you know, are uh, good, legitimate ways of voting. And, you know, this is really tough. We don't get very much recognition, board members or managers, but, you know, of course, our job is to make our board members and managers look like superheroes and be able to report at their next meeting. You know, how much money did I save uh, by adding this electronic option and not sending out all those paper ballots? Those are the kind of things that our boards and our managers want to report on at the meeting is that they're looking at ways to maximize the assessments and uh, monies that are coming into the association and using them on new technology and ways that they're going to increase participation and meet quorum and achieve and get all of these important issues voted on. So uh, there are so many benefits and boards and managers, you are going to look like superheroes for bringing these options to your community. I know sometimes you get a lot of pushback, but just provide it as an option. And I bet you'd be surprised at how many, even those people that are saying no are probably going to vote electronically. All right, so I've got one more slide. This is always my funnest one, but I think I'm going to stop here. We've got seven minutes left in our hour together, and I'm going to try and answer some of these questions. Um, Kathy, I think the most you... important question we're getting is, is pricing, and I believe you're going to be okay. that. Yeah. All right. Yes, I am going to. I'm going to go uh, through. So let's talk about pricing really quickly here, and then I'll go to my myth busting slide. This is my favorite one. Uh, of course, you know, pricing is dependent on the number of lots or units. All I know is the pricing structure that we have. Uh, and we will go, let's say, for example, we've got one to 100 homes full service setup and management of, you know, the entire vote or survey. We assign you a vote manager, everything here. Can you be looking at $591 a year? And if you had any additional votes, they'd be $275 each. So you could make the most of all of the voting during that year. Now, let's say we're at 101 to uh, 200. Uh, you would be looking at $645, $655 uh, for the entire year. And then, of course, going on to 201 to 300, uh, you would be looking at about 700 and then 755. And the pricing structure goes up. The best way to, you know, look at the pricing or find out how much it's going to cost in your community is to get some estimates. You know, estimates are free. On the next slide, I'm going to pop up our email address. So if you do have questions or you want to look at estimates, there is no, you know, they are free. Well, we, we hate to say free. They are, um, you know, they are free. Of course, we prepare estimates all the time. And then you can take the steps to arrange to see the agreement, complete that and ask us to work for you. So 
Um, I'll pop that up next. So hopefully that answered some of your pricing questions. It's not expensive. Of course, it is more expensive at the lower levels, but the comfort of knowing that your vote is ran correctly, that you have a partner that's going to help with any challenges or questions, that someone else is running and managing and setting up the ballots, making sure it meets all of the statutory requirements is really, um, you know, the most comforting part of electronic voting and that full service setup and management. So these are some of the things we hear all the time about why owners are, or why boards are not considering it. <clears throat> we don't have all the you know, owner email addresses. I don't think we ever will. Uh, you know, and maybe in years to come, people will start feeling more comfortable or they'll have to get an email just for one reason or another. Uh, or those people who are, you know, using paper ballots or will have a representative, you know, that they have vote for them, you know, but it's okay. You will have a better list of email addresses after your first online vote than you've ever had just make sure that you're keeping it updated. Uh, it's not legal. We talked about that today. The, it is legal. Your state statutes uh, allow for it. They passed that law in 2015. Very few changes to that law since then. Make sure that you're looking at your documents, you're consulting with your legal professional to make sure you can incorporate it. But in most cases, you probably just have to pass a resolution. My documents don't allow it. This could be true. It could say that you're not able to use any telephonic or electronic means. Doesn't telephonic take you back uh, in time? Uh, but you know, some of the older documents never even considered that there would be a way for someone to submit a ballot electronically. And in those cases, you probably are going to have to do an amendment to your documents. Uh, any provider that you are talking to, ask them, what do you do with my emails? Uh, the worst thing, of course, is starting a vote and, you know, managing it and everything. And you're using one of your portals or a management software uh, and you're at you through another company and they're using and the owners start receiving emails from all kinds of other vendors that they've sold their emails to. This is the worst thing to have happen. Ask that company what they do with your email address addresses. We always say they are considered the property of the association and only used for the purposes of voting. And that is the answer that you should be expecting from your e-voting provider. Uh, what if the results are challenged? Uh, this is a big one and it's happening more and more out there. Uh, if owners are getting together, asking questions, wanting to see the reports and whatnot, you don't want to manage that on your own uh, and you can't. Uh, you want an e-voting provider that's going to produce what I call a viewing report so that everyone can come in and see which lots or units voted. You know, in Florida, everything's all secret, so they'll never see how anyone voted anyway. But they do want to see that if the vote was run in a professional manner and according to the state statutes. And that's what you want to be able to report for them. And in most cases, uh, you know, we have to learn new software. You don't. Uh, in most cases, the software will uh, work for itself. The full service setup and management will do everything. And um, But if you do have to learn new software and you have to become a voting expert, we're accepting resumes right now. No. <laughs> um, but, you know, just make sure that you're considering all of your risk, of course, uh, you know, and making sure that you're, you know, able to be the manager that they want you to be and you don't have to be a voting expert too. So that's my last and final thoughts that I like to leave everyone with. Don't be worried. It's okay. Start today. Your owners, owners will embrace it and you will begin to have that, you know, a next level of participation. So I noticed the feedback form came up. Please fill that out. And then, uh, Ashley, did you want us to answer any more questions here? Yeah, of course. I will just do my little spiel at the end. So if anybody has to run off, that's fine. Thank you so much, Kathy. Um, as Kathy mentioned, I did launch the attendee feedback. So if you can take that quick poll for us, we would really appreciate it. I will also be emailing out the presentation, a link to the video recording of this webinar. Kathy's contact information and information on our future classes. And I will also be giving Kathy the attendee list so she can get you all your CEU credits. Um, but that's it for me. That's all my housekeeping items. So thank you so much, Kathy. I'll go ahead and leave it up. So if you want to answer a few more questions, you are more than welcome to. 
Yeah. Yeah. I think we do. We've got some good ones on here. Awesome. Hey, Liz, you've been monitoring them. Do you yeah. want just to ask those questions? Thank yeah, you. Yeah, there was one. Um, can the online voting be used for international owners? Yes. All they need to have is an email address where we can send them uh, a, an electronic ballot, of course. And remember, the whole reason that electronic voting is so successful is because uh, we're able to send those email invitations or reminders to vote electronically more often than you can send it by paper. So yes, anywhere they are, if they have access to their email, they can receive that email invitation to vote and vote, whether they're in the United States or they're internationally. And Good you keep question. referring you keep referring to condo statutes. Is there any difference for HOAs in Florida? Yes, yes. They're 718, 719, and 720 are all designed. 718 is condos, uh, 719 is co-ops, and 720 is HOAs. The only difference is, is that condo still may have to have an electronic proxy, but it's typically a directed proxy, and they're still making their selections on the candidates or the items. All right. Be sure to go back to my presentation and look at each one of those statutes and the one that uh, fits your community. Let's see. Does the voter certificate need to same trust? Yeah, the voter certificate is typically done outside of the electronic voting process. That's something that the office would normally handle. And uh, for a trust or an LLC or, you know, a multiple owner situation, we would need to know who the primary voting individual is. So it would be very important for those lots or units to have that voting certificate, of course. And we just had a question come in. It says, how is the information concerning owners voting sent to your for firm? And how do we keep your database up to date with all the purchases and sales going on? Mm -hmm. um, well, every everything that we receive with regards to owner data is done by Excel spreadsheet. So we just ask you to export that information out of your property management software and send it to us. Um, for, for sales and different things, there is no, uh, you know, request for funds or payments or anything other than the invoicing to the association for the, um, for the voting package itself. And then, of course, each owner receives a receipt of exactly how they voted, and that is all included in the package. I hope that answers your question. I'm, I'm, not yeah, sure. and it's regarding the Excel. So with our owner data, we receive that to you. And as long as you don't have an owner data record in your documents, we can continue to, um, you know, update the owner data list. And we, with the full service setup and management, they would do that for you. So during the course of the vote. And then we do have another question. Many members don't expect an email from anyone but our community manager. Um, or company. Emails go to junk and spam. Can your notices be sent by the management company or maybe, you know, what tools do we provide? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That is a great question. Thank you. Uh, for uh, the way that we do it, of course, is that we assign each community an email address. And when you send out your save the date notice or your official notice, you're going to let them know we've added the option to vote electronically. Here is the email address where you are going to receive your electronic invitation to vote. Please add this to your safe sender list so that you're able to vote electronically on or around this date. If you haven't received your email invitation to vote, please contact the office. So we try and give you all that information ahead of time so you can communicate it out to the owners and they're able to look for that email address. And it's, it doesn't come from us. It comes from the community and it is signed by the community manager or the board of directors. So we customize everything for each individual community in that case. That's a and then we great do question. Have, and thank you yeah. for asking. And we do have Carlton... Um, so an amendment votes, are amendment votes confidential or open to records requests? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Um, in my mind, I want to say that they don't re they're not bound to the secrecy requirement, but we would have to look at your documents and make sure that we're answering that question correctly for you. So it would really be a document requirement. Uh, so we would we would look at that and assist you. Thanks, Carlton. And we can do that. So Joe, just to add on to that last question, so the notice comes from the management company, but our but the actual request to vote comes from the voting site. It so, comes from the email yeah. address that's assigned to the community, which is usually the community name, and we'll give that to you well in advance so you can communicate that to your owners. All right, great question. You know, the only other way you could do it, just, you know, I, I know we have to wrap this up and thank you everyone for staying. Um, the only other way it could be done is if, um, you know, that we provide a link to the voting site and the management company could say, hey, here's a link to the voting site. Please go there and request your voting credentials. But that's going to create a lot of work for the manager. It's typically better if it comes from the system. The owners are able just to click here and move forward and follow through the steps. Uh, but it can be done, you know, both ways. And if you if you have, you know, if you want to follow a certain process, you know, then we will do that. Those votes are not as successful when we're allowing people to go to the voting site themselves and you know ask for their credentials then they have to come back later and use their registration codes so it really is more efficient and does increase participation if we're able to send those email invitations from that community email address all right well there are more if you want. Uh, the, to when will the credits be added to the DPPR? Yeah. Well, I think we've got around 200 to do. Uh, we'll try and finish those by middle part. You know, usually we take care of them very quickly. We're going to notify them after Ashley sends us that Excel spreadsheet, and then the certificates will come after that. So we'll try and wrap that up pretty quickly for you. If you have any questions about your certificates or whatever, you can send an email to that info at votehoanow.com. We're happy to tell you where we're at in that process, but we try and turn those around right away. Yeah, and an email address would be customized for the community. So it would be the community name at ivotehoanow.com as an example. So, and we would prepare the manager with all those tools and resources and the email and the the own voting site. So we, we customize it based on the community name. Thanks for watching. For more great educational content, click the subscribe button now.